Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the next session. Next session, Indigenous health and the interplay between the primary healthcare sector and public hospitals, presented by Mr. Selwyn Button. Introducing the session today is Pricing Authority member, Jane Hall. Good afternoon. I'm Jane Hall and a member of IPA's Pricing Authority. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the next plenary session, Indigenous Health and the interplay between the primary healthcare sector and public hospitals, presented by Selwyn Button. Selwyn Button is a Gungaree man from southwest Queensland, raised in Cherbourg. Selwyn has extensive experience in Queensland health and in the education sector. From 2014 to 18, he was Assistant Director General of Indigenous Education in state schools, where he oversaw significant improvement in outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. Prior to that, he was CEO of the Queensland Aboriginal and Islander Health Council, Chairperson of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Community Health Service, Brisbane Limited, and Director of the Indigenous Health Policy Branch within Queensland Health. In addition, he's a former teacher and worked as a Queensland police officer. I'm sure you'll agree with me that he brings a range of unique insights to this afternoon's presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thanks, Jane, for the introduction. Really appreciate it. Now, can I start my session this afternoon by um, acknowledging traditional owners of the land that we're, we're all meeting and gathering on today. I'm in the middle of Brisbane, um, so I'm on Durable and Jagra country here in Brisbane. Um, so I pay respects to, to their elders past and present and also pay respects and acknowledge the country that, that you're all, uh, I guess, dialed in uh, on the session today. Today, um, my session is, is, is to discuss um, the, the overall hospital care improvement for Indigenous patients and what that might look like. Um, it's built on the back of some experiences. Um, I'm a current uh, director of the, the Lowitzer Institute, the, the National um, Aboriginal Child Islander Health Research Institute, and I'm also a director of the Institute for Urban Indigenous Health. Much of the work that I'll talk about today um, is based on the research that comes out of the Lowitzer Institute and certainly the, the work that we're currently doing at, um, at IUE and, and will continue to do. And I'm hoping today we, we can provoke some thought around some necessary changes within that. Uh, within the hospital system and looking at different things like um, what happens in prices and weighted costings to, to look at improving outcomes. Um, but as I mentioned, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that a lot of the work that you'll, you'll hear about today uh, comes from the work that happens at the Lowitzer Institute um, and from the Institute for Urban Indigenous Health that's based here in South East Queensland. A lot of the work um, and, the, and the work that's been happening across both institutes has contributed to, to I guess, the body of knowledge that I'll, I'll talk through today. Um, some of the research projects that I'll draw on, and, and these are some references, I guess, that I'm certainly happy to share, and hopefully um, people will get some, um, get some value out of having a look at, not just during the session, but post the session. These things, uh, many of these research reports are publicly available. Um, the first one's Managing Two Worlds Together, which is a piece of work that's been happening, um, not only within the Lawrence Institute, but its predecessor, the, the CRC for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Health. Um, prior to us transitioning across to becoming the Lawrence Institute, the CRC focused on patient journey um, it, across across a number of settings. More, more recently, the, the work in managing two worlds together focused on looking at transitioning of care within South Australia. Um, a lot of work from the guys at the Flinders University and looking at um, pa patients transitioning from the APY lands from Port Augusta and other remote places in, um, in South Australia coming to access care in Adelaide hospitals and what that looked like. So a lot of the work that we'll talk about today and, and certainly focused on some significant things that um, are affecting Indigenous people and, and are top of the tree in terms of burden of disease for Indigenous people, things like renal disease, uh, things like heart disease, diabetes. So those sorts of things have been part of the process um, and, and I will draw on some of that stuff today. The other pieces of work that I'll draw on today um, from the Institute for Urban Indigenous Health is the recent evaluation that was done by Deloitte Access Economics um, and provided to, to us in the board, as the board earlier this year, um, and also some other research articles that were undertaken through The Lancet and, and other publications uh, that focused on our birthing in, uh, birthing in our communities program, which is um, essentially our mums and bubs that's been developed and the relationship that's happened with, with hospitals 
um, with the Mater Hospital in particular here in, in Brisbane um, over the last four to five years. So I'm not telling you anything you, you don't already know, but certainly drawing from the research in terms of looking at those barriers uh, to accessing hospital care for Indigenous people. Um, the rural and remoteness is a significant one, and this draws on the work that comes out of the Managing Two Worlds uh, together. Rural remoteness is an issue. Um, the impact of illness or injury is an issue, not just about the what they're being treated for and coming to, to hospital for or presenting for, but also it's the complex conditions. There's, there's multiple chronic diseases. Um, and those things then do add up and do have a significant impact on whether or not a person will access care and will access ongoing care. Language and communication barriers continue to be um, a significant one. Uh, financial resources, whether or not people actually have the financial means to, to attend care and to, and to access ongoing medication and, 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 other, and other visits in terms of um, specialists and even having their own, I guess, financial resources for caring duties. What happens when a mum, what happens when, when, a, when a dad has to go away and they have duties to look after the children or family um, whilst they're away and, and go to hospital. And the whole notion of cultural safety, um, which is a fairly significant one. Um, what does it look like in terms of, am I going, are my cultural needs going to be met when I go for hospital care within a hospital environment? Um, the, the table on the, on the right hand side, and gives you a quick snapshot that comes out of the research, which then talks, gives you, a, I guess, an indication of patient journey um, when they're transitioning through primary hospital and then back to primary care. Um, what it actually, what, what it means, what have we seen, what have we experienced um, for, for patients themselves? And certainly for those who have the means and those who um, are, are functioning well and engaging well within services, that journey is usually pretty good. Those that, uh, that have, um, multiple chronic diseases, though it has have complex conditions, um, it can be a bit of a spiral. That it's very much about um, getting getting access to primary care, but then also managing through hospital environments, um, going through a sickly, you know, circular arrangement in the sense of um, going to different doors and going to different specialists, and then what that looks like in terms of their ongoing needs. Um, so it is it is it does remain a significant challenge. Um, the other issue that certainly is at the forefront um, of, of cultural safety is the issue of racism. Um, and many of the research reports that have come out of the Lower Truth Institute have pointed to the fact that one of the most significant issues in relation to improving the health and well-being um, of Aboriginal Islander people has been their experiences around racism um, in, in hospital settings or in, in institutions and environments. Um, some of the research that came out um, that was done in 2009 Look, this notion that you know, 93 percent of South Australians are experiencing racism in formal and informal settings. So it's inside the health system. So these these issues then impact upon a person's thinking and decision making around whether or not they do engage in the process of going putting them through the public hospital system or the health system because of the fact that there are significant barriers or enablers um, or some um, some things in place that prevent them from accessing the care and prevent them from access, accessing their needs. So those surveys and studies have all pointed to the fact that racism does exist, institutional racism does exist. Uh, it's really now a matter of how do we overcome those challenges and what it looks like. And the other thing that we looked at in terms of the racism effects is that it's racism has an impact upon people's health and wellbeing. Um, so it's not just the fact that people are experiencing racism, when racism is experienced and then they're confronted with racism, it also impacts upon the person's well-being. Um, so there's plenty of studies in the, in the work that's gone on through the Lodge Institute that pointed to the fact that it is a significant factor around how do we make sure that we're encapsulating um, the, the means or in, ensuring that those things are at the forefront of clinicians thinking when we're looking at improving health outcomes. That racism plays an effect, it absolutely has a negative effect, um, so what do we need to do to change? How does it fit, in it? and I guess this is the point of the conversation and certainly the, the work that's happening at, um, at IPA, how does it fit in the sense of hospital funding? Um, and certainly what we do see and what we do know, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, um, that there is an in, in Indigenous patient waiting for hospital admissions and association services that sits in all hospitals across the country. So those things do exist. Unfortunately though, when you unpack those and have a look inside particular agreements, the model is designed for Indigenous pa patients to remain in hospital um, and it's indexed for those returning due to complications. It's not necessarily 
reoriented for a wellness approach. It's not looking at it in the sense of saying, if hospital and the settings around hospital have traditionally been barriers because those settings, and those institutions have created spaces where um, Indigenous people don't want to engage in, and certainly there's experiences of racism in those hospitals that they're reluctant to engage in, then with designing a system for them to have to go um, isn't in the best needs of, of Aboriginal and Islander people. So what do we need to do to, to think about it differently? But this is not a unique problem um, that's in the health space at all. Funding for index, funding indexation for Indigenous clients happens in all social services sectors. Um, and I've worked in a lot of those social services sectors, so I've seen, seen it um, in, in many different areas, that education, um, in child safety, in legal services and in housing, um, as some great examples. Those, those services, um, there is an indexation or a weighting that's provided to funds that go to service providers, to social service providers, to support Indigenous people in those spaces. There is an additional weighting that comes on board. Unfortunately, though, across all of those sectors and not unique to health, um, they're funded to keep Indigenous clients in the system. It's not necessarily designed to support overall well-being and improvements to actually help them navigate outside the system, which is about improving their overall well-being so that they can actually navigate those systems themselves without the support and without the necessary backing um, of a particular organisation that they need to be attached to. So it's something to consider when we're thinking about the design work that goes in in the first instance. At the moment, it's, it's geared towards keeping people sick. It's geared towards keeping people engaged in a system and being dependent upon an actual system as opposed to them being becoming independent and as opposed to them um, certainly want to be able to navigate and create some, a sense of agency for themselves around improving their overall well-being. So there's absolutely a need for change. And I guess I want to talk through some examples now um, of the work that we've done in South East Queensland particularly, which points to some ways of navigating through that space to create change, where it is about putting responsibility and putting certainly the decision-making in the hands of Aboriginal and other people who are affected by the system and how do we help them navigate through the process to, to improve their own health. Uh, so an example that's been working in South East Queensland for, since 2014 um, is a program that's called the IUE Connect Services. And IUE Connect um, essentially is work that's been happening between the, the Institute for Urban Indigenous Health and the Metro North and Metro South um, Health and Hospital Services. And working directly with those, with those two major providers and those major hospital facilities here in the middle of Brisbane to look at what's the best way to manage care and certainly complex care for Indigenous people coming in and out of the system. One of those, a, a large part of it in terms of the way that, the, that we've geared and designed the process has been focused on those with the most complex needs, who have the most complex needs, who are providing the most challenge. So it's not just about picking people who are coming in and out um, or picking people who are going in and require little care and attention and helping them transition to the home and making sure that they're provided the care in the home. Um, what this is about and what IUE Connect has been doing is targeting those who are the most vulnerable. A large majority of the clients that come into the IUE Connect process are clients who are, have been referred from agencies because of drug dependency, because of alcohol, alcohol abuse, um, because of ongoing engagement uh, with the criminal justice system. So it's working with some of the most vulnerable to work out those, they do have specific health needs. What are those health needs? And how can we provide the step up and step down care when they're going in and out of hospital um, to better support and manage those things, their conditions, and have the direct conversations with clinicians in the hospital to support them um, when they're getting back home and their ongoing care to engage back in the primary healthcare space at their local clinic. To give you a bit of an idea of where the connect, where the referrals are coming from, as you can see, 47% of the referrals into the program have come from the Queensland Police Service. So these are people who have been certainly active and been, been involved in the criminal justice system um, and are continuing in that space where the police have been referring them across to say, 
the, the response that we're providing in looking at this in terms of criminalising this behaviour isn't working. So we need to come up with a new response and that response has been about referring them to, to a service like IUE where it's not just looking at their care needs but also a lot of those complex conditions and supporting and helping them um, through a range of other social services and navig helping them navigate that space as well. Um, hospital and community have been providing referrals, but hospitals and community have, prov have provided referrals, not necessarily in the way that we've we designed it in the first place. Um, most of the time, the hospital and community referrals have been the IUE Connect, IUE Connect service team reaching into the hospitals, not necessarily about the hospital saying, okay, well, there's a service here that we can work with that's outside that provides a step up and step down care. Um, and can support you with your ongoing needs, let's get them involved in the process from the get-go. What has been happening is because um, a lot of the clients that are going into the hospital setting have been engaged with one of the, the clinics in Southeast Queensland prior to going into hospital, part of the check-up check process and part of the ongoing, I guess, case management and working with vulnerable clients, they've been in contact with them, realise they've been in hospital, and then worked out, okay, well, how can we actually engage with them whilst they're in the hospital and whilst they engage with clinicians to help and support their needs and make sure that the transition out of hospital then becomes a much safer one and it gives confidence to the hospital settings that they're transitioning into care and they're transitioning um, into a space that, that they're going to look after their condition and they're going to manage conditions much better and they've got to qualify people to do that with them. Is there a cost benefit to the to the system itself? And this was some of the work that came out of the Deloitte Access Economics um, review or the evaluation that happened last year and, and early this year, where it actually shows that in terms of monthly referrals, um, whilst it whilst there there was a um, the more referrals that come through, um, the less the cost is to the overall system, and the cost is still even if there's less referrals that do come through the system, isn't that high when you look at the weighted activity unit cost of an individual sitting in a hospital bed compared to, to I guess, the referrals through the, the IUE Connect service and making sure that they can transition their care um, into the home and their ongoing care needs to their local primary health care um, centre as well. Uh, the second one that I wanted to talk about in terms of examples is the, is the IUE Cataract Pathway. So this is something that's been going on since around 2015. Uh, where it was, there was an identified need uh, for Indigenous clients who do suffer from, um, I guess, multiple chronic diseases and have, uh, I guess, ongoing issues around cataract surgery. Because what we'd identified through the process is that getting access to, to cataract surgery and getting access to needs um, wasn't something that was going to be readily available for, for many Indigenous patients and, help trying, and them trying to navigate through the public health system wasn't necessarily working because it was it, it was seen as um, I guess a significant barrier for them to get access to an ophthalmologist. Um, not just even seeing an optometrist in the first instance, but getting to an ophthalmologist, getting the referrals happening, and then being able to to be listed for surgery for cataract surgery, um, and providing that I guess that ongoing care um, pre and post surgery. Those things weren't weren't necessarily working. So we came up with a process where it was very much about um, working with vulnerable patients, going through the case management approach, determining what was necessary, and then working out where do we go. The, the IUE employs optometrists, so it made it easy in terms of the surgical pathway to identify those who are most in need of, um, in need of cataract surgery, and then having the direct conversation with, with the surgical pathways team to determine what was going to be the best way to approach it. It wasn't just about picking a, a couple of people, and working, on, and working out where do you take it from here, it was actually about assessing demand um, and working with clients to assess demand, having the conversation with a hospital facility and then working out, well, what was the best way for us to, to get access to those things? In this particular example, um, and this is some of the things I guess that came out of, that I've seen in, in uh, Professor Duckett's uh, conference uh, presentation and, and sort of the notes that came out of that about the best way to manage through the system and the innovation in the system, the IUE cataract pathway was basically saying that the public system wasn't necessarily providing the need for Indigenous patients requiring cataract surgery. 
So the innovation in this approach was very much about are you reconnecting with the private system and having a direct conversation with the private system, the private hospitals and private ophthalmologists to say, we actually need a different response here. There is a significant demand for this particular service. There's significant demand and need within the Indigenous community to sort out cataracts, which is something that's fairly simple. It was then about saying we couldn't get it through the public system, so how can we take it to the private system and have a negotiated response between community control and the private system about how to des best deal with, with these sorts of issues? Um, and essentially, the private system responded by saying, well, we can be innovative and we can do something different and we can try some new things. And it was even getting down to the, I guess, the finite detail of negotiating what a cost for surgery might look like, um, who shares those costs when that's being charged, um, and how do you make sure that the pre and post care was being sorted because the pre and post care for each individual patient in this case was something that the Institute for Urban Users Health picked up. It was an IUE piece and community control was leading that as opposed to the hospital system. So it reduced the demand on the hospital system significantly, but enabled access, direct access, um, to a, a much needed service for, for many Indigenous clients. What we've seen in numbers over the last few years, and these obviously have been impacted in the sense of looking at um, uh, COVID and what's what's happened with the with COVID around uh, surgery and, and access to surgery over the last couple of years, but we have seen a, a significant increase. And this is very much about so, saying we've got clinicians that are that are, that are part of um, our surgical team within the institute who can work and to determine demand, um, and then have the conversations with private hospitals to work out well, what's the best way to way to deal with it? Reduces the reduces the burden on the hospital for pre and post care because that's happening with through the institute, but it enables, I guess, access for Indigenous people to, to something that's fairly simple. And if we look at in the sense of waiting times, um, certainly for Indigenous people and the way that the model had been structured or is structured and will continue to be structured, the wait time to see an ophthalmologist um, is non-existent because of the fact that the pre and post care is, uh, is done by optometrists, it's, it's done within the um, IUE clinic, um, the equipment is there to enable the screening to, to happen and then provides the advice to the ophthalmologist about the demand for surgery and what surgery needs look like. Um, the IUE optometrist and the clinicians then look at booking the appointments and sort out the days. And so it's done on a, on a schedule um, where the schedule is that will block out a particular day when the demand is there, will block out a particular day with an optom ophthalmologist at one of the hospitals to then channel um, a number of Indigenous patients through to get access to the surgery. The other thing that I wanted to talk or touch on um, very quickly in my last example of what's, what is working an approach that we've undertaken with the Mahara Hospital here in Brisbane and started in 2014. Funnily enough, this one started in 2014 when I was the chairperson um, of the of the Aboriginal Australian Community Health Service here in Brisbane. And I signed an MOU with, um, I think it was ACU and the Mahara at the time, where the researchers were based at, at ACU. And the Mahara came on board uh, to look at innovative ways of looking at this whole notion of birthing in our communities. Um, traditionally, in Brisbane, for those that uh, those that know Brisbane, traditionally in Brisbane, uh, there had been a long history of connection between Indigenous mothers here in this city and the Mater Hospital, um, and that's been something that has been talked about a lot. So we wanted to build on that. Um, Aix Brisbane, the Aboriginal Medical Service, is located right next door to the Mater Hospital, so it made absolute sense that we looked at trying to do things together. Um, so birthing in, in our communities became um, was the was the beginnings of something that was then about how do we progress to look at improving in, improving the way that we provide care and supporting young mothers and supporting those who are um, who are about to become mothers to make sure that not only they get get, ac get access to the right care but they're also supported within um, within the first first few years and the first few months um, post birth. So it was a bit, very much about looking at. Um, the perinatal care and then the post care and what that what, what the ongoing work was. There was a number of facets that, that were built into it, um, but certainly what we have seen the data that it's, since it started in 2013 is that the there'd been a significant increase um, in the numbers of presentations in the first trimester. 
uh, to go for antenatal visits. There'd been a significant increase in the numbers that are that are undertaking five or more antenatal visits. So, so confidence, young mothers and young women um, who are pregnant became very, very confident in the fact that this is something that they wanted to engage in. We created the space for them. And it wasn't just about the birthing process. It was actually about a whole range of other social issues and conversations that could happen to provide support to them and to alleviate some of those stresses and fears about becoming mums as well and about starting new families. So those things are attached to the, the whole biop process. Um, so what we've seen in terms of preterm preterm births, um, there's a significant reduction in preterm births for, for biop clients, um, certainly less than the national average and less than standard care. Um, those who are who are birthing low birth weight babies um, for, and this is something that's fairly significant for Aboriginal families across the country. Um, there's a significant reduction in that for biop clients, and those who are, had, were admissions to neonatal units, there was a significant reduction in that when compared to the national averages um, for for Indigenous mothers and for for mothers in general. So if we look at estimated, the estimated cost benefit from IUE-led care across a range of issues, and certainly this was a piece that came out of the Deloitte report, where the Deloitte report um, took some of those most significant chronic diseases that impact upon Indigenous people and impact upon the community in general to look at the cost comparisons in relation to um, preventable hospital separations and what it might look like. And certainly in, when you look at things like the things like diabetes and respiratory disease and, and heart disease and mental health, which are things that significantly impact upon Indigenous people across the country, the cost benefit that was determined based upon the value that was placed or based upon the formula that was developed um, by Deloitte and others showed that there was a significant cost benefit in terms of accessing care um, through the, through IUI and around the separations or hospital separations in terms of looking at the expectations and making sure that people get access to pre and post care and didn't actually have to be in the hospital for the entire time, that there was there were other surrounding pieces and, and associated services that could make sure that they were getting access to their care needs um, and and certainly then weren't were not vulnerable in the sense of, um, I guess, becoming another discharge against medical advice for, for many Indigenous people, which is still, I, I guess, a a high, um, a high data rate for, for numbers of Indigenous people that don't necessarily stay for the full term in hospital. Discharge against medical advice um, is a, was a significant issue in Brisbane, and it started to be addressed through some of these sorts of processes with with IUE working with partner hospitals. Some of the elements for, for scalability when you think about this in not just a, a southeast Queensland context, but what does it look like for for other places, and can you take it anywhere else? Um, we certainly think it is something that can, can happen in other places. It does require a stable Indigenous backbone organisation. Um, the elements that are built into this are about Indigenous-led decision making. Um, part of the process was about having an Indigenous workforce strategy that goes alongside the programs themselves. A lot of the work and a lot of the staff that are involved um, in all of the work around pre and post care, whichever program it is, are you connect, cataract surgery or BIOC, are all that there's a majority Indigenous staff that are involved in the process. There's significantly strong partnerships with other organisations. Um, and those other organisations, some are public hospitals, many are private hospitals. Um, the good thing about working with the private hospitals, I guess, is the, is the next point around agility. There's agility and innovation between the partners. And agility works within certainly what we've seen and experienced. The agility is far greater in the private setting that we have seen, experienced and seen in the public setting. And we would encourage those sorts of things because what we're talking about are the most vulnerable patients that come into the system and the public system isn't necessarily responding. So we're reaching out to the private and the private system is responding in a much better way. Um, and because it's built within an overall wellbeing model, there's a holistic approach to overall patient wellbeing. Um, what else do we consider? I've only got a couple of quick ones to, to go through. There we go to questions. Uh, funding reform. And if we look at what's what's in the sense of funding reform, there are existing provisions that, that sit inside um, each one of the, the COAG agreements for, for not only state governments, but for hospitals themselves about innovation and thinking about innovation. And what, I'm, what I talk about in terms of innovation is this notion that 
do does hospital-based care need to be led by hospital-based clinicians? What we've shown is examples where that isn't happening. That is not necessarily the case in some of the examples we've got in Southeast Queensland. But can we do more of that? But again, you've got to have those elements of success in place first. But can you do more of that to improve outcomes for some of our most vulnerable clients? Um, and are we using the existing funding levers to best affect for Indigenous patients? One of the classic examples in terms of funding levers and, and the weighted costing that does come come through for, for, for hospital settings across the country um, is the use of Indigenous liaison, liaison officers in hospitals and no disrespect to liaison officers in hospitals across, this, across the country. Um, but are they actually involved in the care planning? Are they involved in the pre and post care um, for every Indigenous patient that comes into the hospital system? I would question whether or not that is actually happening. And if it's not happening, then maybe we need to rethink what we're doing with the additional funds that do come to hospital, which are indexed for Indigenous patients, and working out what's the best way to spend that to make sure that people are getting access to the best care needs, and how do we do that better in the future? What do we need the system to do? Um, and what we've taken in terms of the approach with IUE is this whole notion of a no wrong door. There's a plethora of things that we provide. Um, so it's not just about turning up and getting a health check. There's a range of things that we can and we will do and support our clients through the process. And that's what we think the system needs to rethink is what does that look like? It's not a body part approach. Don't take a body part approach. Look at a wellness approach and how do you create overall wellbeing for families and individuals? And all of our work is, all of the work is actually underpinned by what's called the cultural integrity framework. Um, the ways is what we call it at the Institute. And the ways is very much about our ways of seeing and doing, knowing, belonging and being. And that comes back to the core values um, of, of Indigenous perspectives and what that looks like. And that's something that runs not just within the staff of our organisation, but also at the board level, that our board conversations are very much about the ways and how does that impact upon um, all the work that we do. And that's the end of the presentation. So thank you. And I think we're now going to go to questions. Thank you very much, um, Selwyn. So, fascinating um, presentation. Um, very, very thought provoking. Um, and we do have some questions. I've just got a, a little one from myself in relation to the agility that you had in the private system of accessing private hospitals. Um, why was that there? And how what, what could be duplicated into the public system? Um, look, the, the agility was in, really for us was in, I guess, this whole notion of Indigenous-led decision-making and, and Indigenous-led in terms of the cl clinician's decision-making. Um, what we did find it, as, we, as we're having conversations with public hospitals about similar approaches in similar circumstances for other things is that um, there was a reluctance to go down the path of having decisions being led by clinicians outside of the hospital facility. And not just in a, in a regulatory sense, but also an industrial sense, that um, for, for, private, for public hospitals, some of, those, some of those restrictions were in place sitting inside um, enterprise bargaining agreements and so on and so forth, that restricted their ability to think outside the square around those sorts of things. So that's why when we talk about agility and innovation, um, certainly for us, having the conversation with the private facilities um, became much, much easier to think because they're smaller. Um, we're not talking about significant sized hospitals. Mart is a big hospital, but some of those smaller ones that did the cataract surgery, they're small places. So they were able to be agile because they're much smaller as well. Yeah. Um, both your the BIOC and um, cataract pathway, cataract, surgery programs um the you know quite clear examples it was about the pre and the post as well as the acute um, type of hospital step you know stay a real bundled approach um ipa uh, and through the national health reform uh, agreement are looking at um changing some of the funding models that we have um given the current uh, funding arrangements, what do you think um, IPA could look at changing most soon? Look, I, I think it, for, for me, um, and certainly on the back of the work that we've seen 
and the research that's come out of the, the, the larger institute, it's, it's really about funding innovation um, and, and really taking the risk of having a crack at something because if we're going to have a crack at something that, that achieves success and, um, and provides ongoing care and improves outcomes for the most vulnerable, then it's likely that those things can actually work in other settings as well. Yep. So it's, it's, it's thinking about the scalability. So we've, we've had success with, with BIOC, we've had success with cataract surgery. What are those elements now of scalability that we might be able to take to other places across the country? Um, and thinking in that sense, not necessarily thinking about it in the sense of saying, okay, well, we, we might try that um, and, it, and it's not gonna work, but how do you make sure that you've, you've, you've got someone who's gonna take a risk but you've also got an organisation that's willing to, to partner with hospital settings to make sure that those things um, are, are covered and, and people want to have a crack at it. Thank you. Um, a question from our audience, um, from Natalie. How could we transition to a wellness approach rather than a cost-based funding approach? So that's a good question. And, and looking for, for us, um, and certainly the, the approach and the work that we've done through both Lowitra and, and IUE has been about um, putting the person at the centre and, and looking at them as a whole. Um, and not just as a whole in terms of an individual person, but how do they connect with their family? How do they connect with their community? Um, what does that actually look like in a wellbeing model? And how do we look at treating the person or working with the person to achieve wellbeing in that sense? What does it look like for them? Um, as opposed to being, as opposed to saying, you're going to be a hospital admission now because you've got renal disease and we're going to put you on dialysis. Um, because that's a fairly blunt measure in the sense of saying, you're only turning up to hospital for one particular issue as opposed to working out, well, what's, what are the broader implications? Yes, you might be admitted for renal dialysis because that's an issue for you at the moment. Uh, but what do we look at? in addition to kidney disease, what do we look at in terms of all of the elements that are going to support wellbeing for the individual and their family? And the examples of um, BIOC and cataract, they're, they're sort of, they're two reasonably short-term um, conditions which are, you know, are, are treated, I suppose. Um, yeah. Whereas the, the chronic conditions, which are, um, you know, ongoing, you know, go for more than 12 months. Have you had as much success in those areas or has that got the different challenges that we that go with them? No, look, we've certainly had, we've seen some success and I have it, didn't have it on the slides today, but when we look at average HbA1c levels for diabetic clients who come mm -hmm. through um, IUE clinics across the southeast Queensland, we've seen significant reductions um, in those um, across a long period of time. And that's purely because of the ongoing engagement and the ongoing conversations. And, and again, looking at the person as a whole, thinking about their overall wellbeing, um, and even getting to the point of being able to refer them off to, to other areas where they need some help and support as well. Because sometimes it's not necessarily a medical response or a clinical response, that's the best one. Sometimes it's a social response that you, you need to influence their behaviors around their, their diet. And so it's working out what, how do you do those sorts of things as well. Yeah. Um, and with the IUE, models as well so who is the fund holder if you know is it does iue purchase the surgery from the private hospital or the public sector or is like i suppose you know how are these funds flowing yeah, yeah. so at, at the moment it, it is it is that we're purchasing um services from the private hospitals particularly for, for cataract surgery and for the BIOC, it is, it is purchasing services from private hospitals and private providers. In the, in the BIOC example, it's, it is with midwives, um, private midwives who are coming in to provide their ongoing care and ongoing support. So it is purchasing from outside the system to come in to provide, provide that care. Um, but it's also then the cost sharing arrangement in the sense of saying, well, what for cataract surgery as a, as a good example, What's the, what's the actual funds that's going to flow to a particular facility for undertaking cataract surgery or to a clinician for undertaking cataract surgery? And how do we share the costs? Because the costs that are going to come back into the system aren't necessarily, are coming back for a range of things which are part of the pre and post care. But if we're taking responsibility at, at our UE for pre and post care, well then, okay, well, let, we need to make sure that that comes to us as well. It doesn't cover all the services. 
and that's okay because we are we are certainly still committed to making sure that people get access to care but it's making sure that there's a cost sharing arrangement and benefits for all parties it's not an exact science at this point but we're still working through it well when you talk about um, scalability or reproducing these services you know how much can it be the IUE it, um, successes be you know lifted and duplicated somewhere else or how much does another um, Aboriginal led organisation that like those backbone organisations do they need to design and engage their own communities like, um, to to redevelop a, a system Look, some, some of it will be about taking the learnings for, that have come from South East Queensland. Some of it will be about thinking in relation to um, the existing services in other places. Um, there's, there certainly are some strong backbone organisations who can provide uh, that sort of support in, in other places. But, it, but I guess it's thinking about, I guess, the ecosystem that, that some of the, some of the um, Aboriginal medical services are living in and working out how do you navigate that ecosystem for the best benefit of your, of your clients. Thank you. Um, uh, earlier on in your presentation, you referred to the adjustments that IPA has in our um, current model. Would you argue for a change to those price weights for Indigenous patients in public hospitals or an introduction of additional programs um, to help the incentives that you've noted? You, you, I would probably think about both. Uh, one in the sense of saying that we can, we might look at a different, different way um, of, of looking at um, weighted activity units and costings and what that might look like and the indexation that comes from Indigenous patients. But also, um, if I draw on the experience, my experience working, working in schools um, where there was a, a formula, formulaic base to look at um, what resources would go to a particular school based upon enrolments and indexation that then came on top of that around remoteness and, and other things, and including including Indigenous enrolments at a particular school. It was then about the flexible use of those funds to then, to, to I guess, employ the resources that were necessary. And in many cases, and we still do this, this is a conversation I've been, we were having at the board table um, with the Institute, that we actually do take the same approach in the way that we, we look at the formulaic base of staffing some of our clinics as well, that we will, we will over staff because we know there's going to be attrition um, we know there's going to be some, some turnover and, and, and other things that do happen normally in any workplace but you're overstaffing because one there's going to be turnover but two there is there's there's a i guess a more of a need and demand for services and care with vulnerable patients that are going to be coming coming through the door so it's not just about and, and i guess the example that i use with liaison officers it's not diminishing the role of the liaison officer but it's about saying, okay, well, if you're thinking in terms of staffing um, within a hospital setting, in using your using your indexation or your weighted um, indexation for Indigenous patients to, to look at staffing in a hospital setting, well, what are you using it for in terms of best benefit for a wellbeing model? Um, is is a, a liaison officer the best benefit of that spending, or is it about looking at bringing on board a social worker, bringing on board um, a senior clinician, if you like, that is actually involved in the care planning process for, for patients so that they're getting the best benefit of, of what is required as well. Thank you, so on. And with that, that's all we have time for right now. Um, thank you so much for a fascinating uh, presentation and for um, allowing me to um, throw some questions at you after, afterwards. Um, we're now going to have a short 15 minute break, which gives you time to vote for your favorite presentation of the conference. Um, the voting poll is now open. Um, head back to the timeline and click vote for the best presentation of the activity-based funding conference 2021. Then click the link in the information panel on the right of the screen to cast your vote. Voting will close at 3 p.m. Get yourself some afternoon tea and we'll be back with Dr. Tobias Wirren. See you soon.